You know, uh, honey, you've been with me through all the hard times. You were with me when we lost our business. You're with me when we almost lost the house. You're with me when I was ill. You're with me when all our kids began having hard times. And he said, you know, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm starting to think that you are bad luck. <laughs> You thought I was going to get romantic, didn't you? (laughs) And I think that there's an eagerness in our heart to uh, immediately look for a place to blame. And last week we uh, finished uh, chapter 1 in our new study of Job, and we saw how it says at the end of chapter 1 in verse 22, it says that Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. That's an incredible thought. I wonder if that has impacted your week this past week if you were here, just sort of savoring that thought, that in all that Job went through, if anybody had a right, at least a a justified mental right in someone's mind, to charge God with wrongdoing, surely it would have been Job, but he did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And so today, sort of there's another scene, uh, the curtains close and then reopen, and we find ourselves where we found ourselves back in chapter 1 in verse 7 through 12, but today we're in chapter 2 through 6, and it's sort of Satan round 2. This morning, we're going to be talking about things to keep in mind about Satan. Now, we, we come to church to worship God and to learn about God and grow in God's Word, and so it's unusual for us to give, shed light on our enemy today. But we certainly aren't trying to give undue attention to the enemy or undue credit to the enemy. But in warfare, those who are strategizing the war plan, they have to spend at least a decent amount of time considering the ways of the enemy. And so as I'm thinking as to why in God's unerring word he would give us so much detailed information in a couple spots in the book of Job about Satan and how he works and what he's up to, I think it's incumbent on us to have one of those war room kind of discussions today and not be unaware of the devil's schemes. And so as we learn some about the enemy and his tactics... I'm going to first of all read verse 1 of Job chapter 2. And it says this, On another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. This is really similar to verse 7 of chapter 1. And one of the, it sounds just like what happened then. So there's a, there's a celestial staff meeting, sort of a, a cabinet meeting with the leader of the angels, and their cabinet meeting seems to have an intruder there. There's an interruption in the cabinet meeting, and it says that Satan came to present himself before him. Once again, with these verses, there's a, tendon, there's a temptation to overread into them. And for someone to say that Satan can just pop into heaven anytime he wants, that kind of thing. Certainly we know that to some degree Satan has that right as we read the book of Job. But what do we learn specifically in this verse about what the enemy is up to? Well, the first principle this morning about things to keep in mind about Satan. Number one, he is persistent. Now, persistent is a generally considered a virtue, isn't it? We are to be persistent in our love. One of the verses I like uh, about persistence is 2 Thessalonians 3.13. It says, never tire of doing what is right. Do you ever sometimes just get weary with doing the right thing because you're not seeing the results you wanted or you're not having as much, quote, success as someone that's doing the wrong thing? Well, God's Word reminds us to keep the long-range perspective and never tire of doing what is right. Well, the, the thing about Satan, he never tires of doing what is wrong. We should quickly wear out of doing what is wrong. Many of you know if you spend any time in a prolonged period of defiance of the Lord, it is exhausting to keep on sinning when you're a believer. Believers don't have success with their sin. 
Because there's always this conviction. There's always this sense that we're not doing what we're made to do. We're not honoring the one who we belong to, who our soul belongs to. And persistence in doing the right thing is a virtue. But we have to realize that Satan has a good, bad quality. It's good to be persistent, but it's bad to be persistent if you are persistent in doing what is wrong. You see, we don't get spiritual days off, as I mentioned before. We, ha- we should have this spiritual tenacity to always keep moving forward. And we must realize the reason we do that is because Satan has that same tenacity. He's always plotting. So he didn't get what he wanted from Job. He predicted to God that, he, that Job was in it just for the perks that Job's heart was not genuine. If you remove that stupid little head you have around him, I'll show you, God, who Job really is. And he's not easily deterred because Satan was embarrassed, so to speak, because the hedge was removed and Job had one of the most beautiful godly responses one could ever have. So Satan was clearly wrong. And I guess we should note that Satan does not like being proved wrong. He's not willing just to play nice. He's not willing to sort of, I don't don't ever spend any time really watching UFC or MMA type of fighting, but I've seen a few clips through the years, and it's sort of very different than boxing. Boxing uh, it was popular when I was young, and it, uh, it, it really almost, it's a brutal sport, but it almost seems like a gentleman's uh, profession compared to mixed martial arts, doesn't it? Because mixed martial arts is one of the few sports where when someone is down, like if you were really upset uh, and you were hit, you're hitting someone and you were boxing and they go down, the referee in the ring keeps you away from him. And the truth is, in the MMA, when someone goes down, you're still allowed to flail at them. And here, Job is not out, but he is down. Even in street fighting, there's got to be some kind of etiquette that it's kind of wrong to mess with someone while they're down. Satan doesn't have that politeness about him. When we are down, Satan is still coming after us. So we should be on guard to note that, you know, if we're down in an area of our life, that's just when we become Satan's target. Some of you, have you ever put yourself on one of those do not call registry lists from the robocalls? Have you ever found that those don't always work? You feel so proud of yourself. Hey, they're never going to call me again. And then you get all these great credit card offers that come to your phone and things of that nature. I read a story that there was a lawsuit of some robocall type company that was calling people that were on the do not call registry and they lost some lawsuit and one of the people that was interviewing them asked what uh, you know what do you make of that company and they said they are really good at being devious if someone puts a great lock on the front door they get in through the back basement and satan is the same way he is persistent Now, brothers and sisters, everything I say today, I want you to know that we have hope in Christ, that uh, the greatness of the one who dwells within us makes Satan's ways um, seem very, very weak because of the power of God that dwells within us as believers. And if we we can resist the devil by the power of God, and we read in James chapter 4, verse 7, that he will flee from us as we submit to God. But we can't forget his persistence. Now look at verse 2. Once again, this is a flashback to what we read from chapter 1. It says, And the Lord said to him, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. So, same question God asks. Once again, not out of ignorance because God didn't know what was going on. It seems to be formality or maybe once again he wants Satan to express his intention. And Satan says the same vague answer, at least it sounds vague to us, I'm just out roaming God, I'm just out doing my thing everywhere. Now we know what his thing is in the New Testament, Peter basically recites what Satan said there, that Satan roams 
but he roams as one who prowls, prowls like a roaring lion seeking to spiritually devour us. So we learn a second principle about Satan from verse 2, and it's number two on your outline. It's simply this, he has a simple, consistent message. That's, uh, that's sort of the power of advertising, is it? When a company has a simple, consistent message, they seem to get their message across better and clearer. And Satan's message is the same thing. He doesn't have like a wide tackle box a variety of methods. It's basically one method. The method is deception, and he employs his method by roaming everywhere and deceiving people people as much as he can. That's how he rolls. That's what he does. He doesn't change his tune. He is not, uh, he doesn't have a lot of variety to it. I was, I was talking with my wife earlier with, with, with Mrs. Lee about a concert we had at the downtown campus a few months ago. We brought in Christian singer Fernando Ortega, and I'd listened to his music for years, and I had met him one time when we were uh, at their home church in Albuquerque, where Susie and Fernando are from. And I was, uh, he, I've heard him on, in some of his concerts, he says that he's a mellow artist. And then if he's ever on a stage with uh, like in a rock type setting, that he keeps doing his thing. And I noticed when he, he, all he has is just him and the piano, and all of his songs are real soft and slow. And he never deviated from that. And we even, we even clapped him into an encore. So you've been to a concert before, there's an encore, there's this, yeah, and everyone gets their guitars back on, you get behind the drums. He, we encore him out there, he gets out there and he plays, more love to thee, O Christ. I mean, the calmest song you've ever heard in the history of encores. <laughs> and I'm sitting there scratching my head, but thinking, wow, he knows who he is, <laughs> And he doesn't ever deviate from what his gift is, where his sweet spot is. There's wisdom to that as an artist. There's discernment. There's wisdom to that as a company. But it's frightening that Satan always does the same thing. He never deviates. He's always roaming, seeking to devour, and his methodology is deceit. That's why I want to commend again to us, for us to be men and women of God that fall in love with the truth. You, you recall the passage in Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul is urging the church to put on the full armor of God? One of the things it says about truth is in 6.14 of Ephesians, it says to put on the belt of truth. And of course, we know belts hold up our pants. I remember several years ago when I had gone on a diet, I'd lost like 20 or 25 pounds. And one of the reasons I don't like to, I try not to lose weight anymore is because I don't like to buy new clothes. <laughs> That's how I justify my size. But you can ask Mrs. Lee, I really don't like to buy new clothes. I just like old things that work, you know. <clears throat> but so I'm going through security after I had lost all this weight at an airport. And of course, they, have to, they make you take off your belt for all of the belt bombs I have in my belt, you know. And so it goes through security, and I'm, I'm holding up my pants. They are falling down. And I was scared. I was nervous as a cat in a room full of rockers when I had to do this. You know, that, that second of terror, you know, <laughs> trying to be a good servant of the Lord, and I, <clears throat> and I put on my belt. I was so relieved to put on my belt. I was like, thank you, God, for belts. And I thought about that verse, Ephesians 6, 14, to put on the belt of truth. Think about for a moment, when you don't have the belt of truth around your waist that is permeating your mind and settling your soul, you have a belt of lies. And the only thing holding your spiritual life up are the lies that your heart's telling you and the lies that the enemy is telling you. What's, what he's telling you is that it's okay not to forgive that person because they really wronged you. It's okay not to be generous because you might need all that money one day. It's okay to indulge in sexual sin because 
at least you feel really good when you're doing it. It's okay to promote yourself and to be full of you because you have merited all of the praise that you desire. One lie after another that the little frail belt of deceit holds up temporarily, but it's the belt of truth that fits together a believer's wardrobe. And Satan's consistent and persistent message of deceit is always there, and we must have the spiritual audacity to say, I'm going to buckle with God's Word, with His belt of truth. In verse 3, we read the Lord speaking to Satan, saying these words, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Now, this is similar to what God said before, but the end of the verse, there are a couple of additions that we don't find in one, I believe, verse 9 in the previous discussion. But note again, The Lord brings up Job to Satan. I don't think we have a perfect answer and reason as to why God did that. I think at this point, he's likely, so Satan's desire to bring people down, God is contradicting that to say, hey, Job is doing well, isn't he? I remember the staff meeting you infiltrated earlier And you said that Job was in it for the perks and didn't really love me, but my servant is doing well. By the way, isn't it a beautiful thing that God called Job his servant? What a great way for us to have our identity. I don't know if God is up in heaven speaking about us, but wouldn't you love for him to refer to you as my servant? Job's not a pastor. Job's not like a spiritual celebrity of the evangelical world. He's a faithful businessman that was doing right, honoring God, loving his family, and the Lord called him my servant. By the way, we must resist where we find our identity from in terms of a worldly sense. Don't ever find your identity in external things, in accolades that people give you, in merits you're trying to attain. Always find your identity in God, and may your position in Christ always be His servant. He is your master. You are His servant. Job commends, the Lord commends Job and says there's no one like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That was a description in chapter three, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 that the, the book gave him. And then it says, and he still maintains his integrity. What a beautiful thought, isn't it? To be a person of integrity, to have a consistent honesty about him. The pure in heart is what Job was. He was, had a consistent profession. He praised God before he had, when he had everything, and he praised God when he lost everything. He held on to his integrity. It's something that's very much waning in our society in our day. Honesty is something that can be sort of pushed aside as a, as a bonus if you, if you have it, but it is very integral to our spiritual life that we be dependable, honest men and women of integrity, and God commends Job for that. What does the Lord mean when He says, though you incited me against Him to ruin Him without any reason? So, you might think on initial reading it sounds odd for the Lord to accuse Satan of inciting him, Job, against him. Um, Is God evading responsibility here because the Lord's the one who brought him up in the first place? Well, I think the reality is there are, there's a primary and a secondary cause to a lot of things in this world. And if God is sovereign over evil while not pursuing and inciting evil, as the Scripture declares, then secondary causes are held responsible. So though God can't knew that we would commit evil and is sovereign over the reality for us to choose evil, He holds the secondary cause responsible for things. So you and I can't blame God when we do wrong. We read in James, for God does not tempt evil, 
doesn't tempt anyone toward evil. He is not, is not held responsible for evil, though he reigns over it and allows for it to be. And so while, yes, God basically said to Satan, my servant Job is different than what you're describing, and then Satan went after him and caused all the harm when he said, you incited me against him, and then it says to ruin him, I think that God is reminding Satan that Satan is the one that went after his crops and his animals and his children. It wasn't in God's heart to do that. Certainly God did allow that, but the secondary cause of that act that was unknown to Job holds the responsibility. That seems to be what God is insinuating by that sort of difficult to understand phrasing. And then God does say, without any reason. Now, that sort of bothers us a little bit, doesn't it? Mrs. Lee and I were speaking with someone this week that had had a tragedy in his life about a year ago, and he was upset and was sharing his heart, especially with Susie, and he said, I just want to know why God would do this, why God took this person from us. And we wish there were a reason. Why would this happen to me, O oh God? And as you'll see at the very end of the book, there is no perfect answer given. There are things we can see that were purposeful, that God allowed for reasons of growth. But here God himself says that the tragedy that was done to Job was done without any reason. It doesn't mean that there was no purpose behind God's allowing it, but it simply meant to say that there were no deeds that were correlated to Job's treatment. Why are you allowing this? What did I do to deserve this? Sometimes the answer is there was nothing you did to deserve this, other than all of us deserve nothing from God other than punishment. Anything we receive other than that is grace. But God is reminding us that the righteous, for reasons known to God, live in a world of suffering, and therefore we will experience suffering. And what Satan does is always the opposite of God. That's the principle on number three. Another thing to note about Satan, that he is always the opposite of God. God's intent for us are good and wise, and Satan's intent is to ruin us. That word ruin means to swallow up. God wants to flourish us spiritually. Satan wants to ruin us spiritually. So with him being so persistent and with that real consistent message of roaming and deceiving, it's unfortunate that he is the opposite of God and all that is good. Now in verse 4, Satan uses a sort of a proverb that was likely known very clear in the early ancient civilizations, and for us it sort of escapes a clear meaning, but Satan says to the Lord in verse 4, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. We're going to note in verse 5 that Satan is basically asking God, okay, let's up the ante a little bit, but the fourth principle is, number four in your outline, is that he has a convincing but wrong plan. In other words, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, Satan, who's not one to lay down and act like everything's okay, and act like he's not one to admit failure. Are you ever slow to admit failure? We like to find all the other reasons why something failed if there has been a, a failure. But Satan is not going to admit that his plan didn't work, and he has a, a, a convincing plan, but a wrong one. He's wrong about Job's response again, as we'll see next week. But he says, skin for skin. Now, as theologians have debated about what is meant for that, there's a few different options of what it could mean. Uh, some say that the skin of the animals, remember the sacrifices that Job offered to the Lord on behalf of his kids in verse 4 and 5 of, of chapter 1 of Job? He, they offered sacrifices in case they had sinned in their hearts. Maybe he was saying all those skins of animal sacrifices did not protect the skin 
of his children. Or maybe he was saying that he was okay with the suffering of his children's skin, but his own skin, that's where you'll find it, Lord. So he had his, ki- his kid's skin was taken away. Let me injure his skin. And he'll, he'll give up everything if you can just injure him. Well, you can sort of see Satan's point. And that's when we get into a dangerous spot. It's one thing for God to see Satan's point and say, okay, I'm allow this for sovereign purposes that we're not going to be able to grasp. But we should never concede to Satan that he has a good point in our own spiritual lives. We must realize that any point he has is one of deception. I think we could also understand that it's one thing for our hearts to break for Ukrainians who are having to flee their country or having to hunker down for their safety. It's one thing for us to pray for them, try to send help for them, and watch with horror at something happening to them, but for that same thing to happen to you. You've driven by many traffic situations where you're with great sorrow watching a a horrifying scene, but everything is different when that happens to you. We'll pray for the person that has cancer or heart disease, but when you get that call or someone in your family has that call, everything's different. And, and Satan is trying to say, hey, listen, he wept for his kids, but he's going to take his little Job fist and stick it in the air to you and curse you forever if you just let me touch him. That's what he contends in verse 5 when he says, But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Well, the fifth principle we see on the outline is that Satan regularly makes false accusations. False accusations. Job was accused of doing something, or at least was predicted that he would do something, that we will see he does not do. Now, it's also true that later on in the book of Job, Job does struggle with his faith. But Satan's initial prediction is incredibly wrong. Satan, the word Satan, means the one who accuses. And there's nothing more uncomfortable than being accused of something you did not do. I have this memory. I was in Bible class. It was, uh, I think it was church history. And I, I don't know why I think of this when I think of wrong accusations, but we had this very straight-laced professor, and he was the dean of the school of theology at the college where I attended. It was a real stickler for every little thing. And we had like a pop quiz. And so the, uh, the professor said, okay, pass your papers in. And so I get the paper, and I'm putting mine in, and I look at the papers. And I pass them up to my neighbor, and Dr. Neely said, Brother Lee, are you looking at someone else's paper? I'm telling you, I was, uh, this servant of the Lord was incredibly embarrassed. <laughs> and I, I was, I don't know, I, was just, I wasn't looking at anything and taking answers. And I wish Dr. Neely was here today so I could really tell him, hey, I didn't do that, sir. <laughs> but uh, you know that feeling when someone says you did something that you didn't do. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa I, I didn't do that course sometimes the louder that we protest the more guilty we look doesn't it now satan accuses us of having done things we haven't done or sometimes he accuses us of doing things that we have done but that christ if you're in christ but that christ has forgiven and so If you're before Christ, if you're in Christ and he has justified you, meaning he's put his righteousness in your account, there's no evidence that that crime, that sin was ever committed in the eyes of God. And so why do we care so much about what Satan lies about us? If the one that we stand before, we're not going to stand before Satan one day, brothers and sisters. We're going to stand before God, the one who justifies us the one who's made us right with him. And yes, it's true. Satan can accuse us of doing a bunch of wrong stuff, and we have done those things. But if we're in Christ, the accuser's power is taken away. Let me read you and remind you of Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and 34, if we have that on the screen. Matter of fact, 
Is it, do we have verse 33 as well? Or is that, uh, that's all together, okay. Let, let's read that, would you? Yeah, here we go. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies, verse 34, who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died? More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us, Romans 8, 33 and 34. What a powerful question that Paul asked. Who is he that condemns? It is God who justifies. So Satan can do his accusing game all day long, but if you're in Christ, the accusations don't stand. In verse 6, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is your hands, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Now, if we were involved in the, in the heavenly staff meeting, I don't think God has a big suggestion box where he takes input from the angels and say, hey, what do you guys think I should do here? God acts. He, as we read in Psalm 115.3, the Lord's in heaven and he does what pleases him. He's the one being that doesn't need to consult others for his decisions. But let's just say that he did for a second. And he asked Village Park or he asked First Baptist Leesburg, hey, what do you think I should do here, guys? We would say, well, Lord, Job suffered more than anybody we know. Job has had enough. Not only has he had enough, look at how good he did. I say, you don't take Satan's bait. Don't let him touch him. Is that what you would counsel God? <laughs> I know you're hesitant to nod your head because we don't counsel God. I'm, I'm making up a scenario here. But most of us would think in our heart, why would you allow this? He says to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Now, as confusing as it may be for us to wonder why God would allow skin for skin, why God would okay Satan's touching his, his skin, keeping his life, there's, some, there's something encouraging here. One, uh, God, first of all, knows things that we don't know. He sees things that we can't see. There was something in Job's spirit that needed to be molded, that it was invisible to everyone except the Lord. And God cares more about his glory than he does about our comfort. But something else that is a great reminder here is the sixth principle is that we, we still see in this picture that Satan is on God's leash, that God has limits to what he will allow the enemy to do. And that's of great comfort. Did you ever walk by that house that had the meanest junkyard dog you ever seen in your life? And he comes after you and there was something, there was some glee in your heart when those fangs and that barking were stopped because he went past his chain and he was chained. And you were really praying that chain would work. Well, Satan has a, is, is on a chain and that chain will work. In other words, there's what God won't allow Satan to do are things that we do not know. But they are clear. Satan is not sovereign. He always reports to God. And the blank under number six, God prizes his glory above our comfort. We don't get to consult God with how he treated Job. Our comfort and our continued ease is not his ultimate priority. Our holiness, God's glory are what God prizes the most. And God allowed something painful to happen here to further Job's spiritual life. Well, this morning, it is not something we like to overdo here to focus on the enemy. But I do want to remind you that the enemy's doom is sure. That as, we, as we've mentioned before, it's, we read in places like Romans 16, verse 20, that very soon the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. That the enemy's doom at the end of the age is sure will be cast into the lake of burning sulfur forever and ever. And those who come to know Christ in a personal way, who embrace the good news of what God has done for them on the cross and through the resurrection and place their trust in Christ alone, we will be with Christ forever in his kingdom of heaven. And maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. You've never trusted Christ for salvation. Maybe today is the day where you come to know Christ in a personal way.